So on with this webinar, which is, as we said already, principles of LBL. These are what we're going to cover today. So we're going to look at just the, the first bit is just to sort of um, overview what we did in the principle in the basic acoustic positioning principles webinar. Just review that a little bit. So those that weren't involved in that can get an idea of what uh, LBL actually is. Then we're going to how we deploy the system, the hardware and the software that is used to actually uh, to, that we use to, 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 to set the system up. Then how we calibrate the LBL array on the seabed. Then we look at the acoustic communications that are happening during that calibration, but also during tracking as well in order to derive a position. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, right at the end, how we derive a position using LBL on there. So it is, is a, an overview, it's principles, a lot to cover in an hour, so I'm going to crack on. First of all, then, what is LBL? For those that were there on the original webinar or that you know already, type up on the screen or into the chat, what does LBL actually stand for? Over to you. So text on the screen or in the chat, what does LBL stand for? Long baseline, long baseline. Yeah, lots of people putting it in. Real good stuff. People have either done their homework or they just know or they were on the first webinar, which is good. It does, you're right, it does stand for long baseline. And that's because we use fixed seabed transponders. Uh, so these, these transponders are placed on the seabed um, and they are sort of hundreds to sometimes thousands of meters apart. A typical large field array, they're usually a kilometer apart. So these are, the baseline is, the mess, is a measure of a distance between two points of reference or a point of reference and a thing we're trying to measure, All right? So the uh, fixed seabed transponder is placed on a seabed in a circle or a square around the area of operation. So everything we're tracking is within the uh, array that we set up, right? So we, we surround those things up. We never track outside the array on LBL, and that's just down to geometry. Um, in, in just acoustic LBL, we're always tracking inside the array, so we surround the air operations. And it works similar to GPS in the fact that we're using trilateration and time measurements to, to determine our location within the array. But instead of GPS peeling, uh, um, uh, pinging all the time, uh, what happens is we interrogate our beacons so we get a, uh, a position on request, if that makes sense. So we actually interrogate the beacons acoustically, they respond, we measure that time, the time travel uh, of all of those, uh, those messages, and by working out how far away, uh, you know, by, by using that time measurement, we calculate the distances and able to, uh, to, to fix our system. Right? It's a range range system, and you're right, you use trilateration concept, just like GPS Rashida, yep, good. Um, and, the other, the key point, the key takeaway from the initial thing we did uh, in the first week is that precision of LBL is independent of water depth. If you set up an array at 100 meters depth, uh, and uh, and then you took the same array, same geometry, same distances, etc., um, uh, an orientation, and then stuck that at a thousand meters, you'd get exactly the same performance out of the system. So that's why that's what makes uh, LBL uh, a benefit is that you can get high confidence, high precision tracking uh, at depth. And the, uh, the last sort of thing that we'll, we'll, we'll touch on again later is the acoustic signals that are out there. There's, there's our sixth generation acoustic uh, um, uh, protocols, which are, everything's wideband, it means it's digital. So we have digital coded communications going through on our sound waves. And the, uh, the, the 6G protocols, the one that's the standard out there, uh, we can, uh, uh, all, all the ranging responses, all those, all those replies come back with some diagnostic telemetry embedded within them. But any additional telemetry, like data from sensors, etc., uh, is a separate command using the same waveforms. Um, and we've recently upgraded that to six plus a new a new breed of, of hardware, which is the same same hardware but better programming and processing aside. Um, and that enables that, that, that telemetry data for sensors, et cetera, and other information to be packaged within the range or added onto the ranging responses, which makes the system more fast, uh, for faster, more efficient, and easier to operate. Um, and uh, Rizzi, I will cover that question later on. So that is the overview. That's kind of the, 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 the a summary of the things that we covered in the first webinar in terms of the principles of LBL, just the, the overview of it. Now we're going to go into a bit more detail. Looking first of all, anyone, everyone's sort of happy with that in general though. If you're happy with that, uh, one of the things I'll be asking you to do is put some thumbs up in the participants window or a tick. There's a green tick, box, uh, green tick at the bottom. 
if you're happy, give us a green tick or a thumbs up. You can click more and go thumbs ups if you like. Uh, and then as we go through, if I, I'll keep um, asking you to sort of confirm that you're still happy. So we'll either change the text to thumbs up or back, back, uh, back again. All right. So moving on then, let's look at the, uh, the hardware and software that we need to actually set up an LBL array. First of all, the software. There are, there are basically two, ver the two software systems out there that, for, that, that Sonaline do for, for LBL operations. The first one uh, is that if you've seen any LBL operations out there offshore, this is the one you'd be familiar with. You know, 97, 98% of LBL construction jobs offshore are using Sonodyne Fusion 6G. Now kind of semi-rebranded as Fusion 1, and you'll see why in a second. Um, so Fusion is a bit, bit old school. It's using our sixth generation hardware. So there's wideband 2 and 2 plus, uh, and also uh, our original, uh, it's also backwards compatible with our wideband uh, 1 systems, which is the 5G stuff. A yellow beacon so but all it's all optimized now for red beacon sixth generation acoustics but the user interface is a little bit old school it's a bit like windows 97 um but it's a powerful tool it's been upgraded in the background the engine in the background has been and the platform has been upgraded significantly in the last few years uh, and this is a very powerful tool and very familiar to anybody who's been doing lbl offshore uh, over the last sort of 10-15 years um, we've recently uh, improved uh, both the hardware and the software. So our six plus uh, hardware and protocol that I just discussed a second ago um, are meant to be driven by our Fusion 2 software. So the Fusion 2 software is, uh, it, it, is, is enabling us to use inertial systems and acoustic LBL systems using the same software package without needing this, a separate PC or hardware between the two. So much easier, much efficient. The user interface and the, uh, and the workflows for LBL operations using Fusion 2 are intuitive and much more efficient. Um, so this is the future of LBL. From, you know, as gradually as people upgrade their hardware over the next few years, you will see Fusion 2 being used more and more offshore for acoustic as well as inertial systems off there, all right? So that's the two software systems uh, and we offer training for both. And, we, and if you've got uh, Fusion 1 training already in the bag, we can do, do, do a Fusion 2 top-up course for, for a, basically just for one day. Uh, it's so intuitive. If you've done Fusion 1, you'll find Fusion 2 uh, really easy to use. So that's the software. Moving on then to the hardware. Let's discuss, first of all, the transceivers. All right? The main transceiver, the, the key transceiver that we're using in LBL systems is the RovNav transceiver. Uh, literally means the, the ROV navigator. So it's, it's meant to be installed on ROVs. It comes in two parts. So you have the bottle part here that contains all the processing power and comms, etc. Um, and then you have the transducer element. This is just the transducer element on the end of a cable. And this is all installed in the ROV or on the ROV. Um, and here's an example of an ROV with it fitted. Now there's, there's the transducer at the top and there's the bottle uh, embedded in the frame below. Uh, so it's meant for a work class ROV. We do have a mini version of the RovNav, which is all in one unit meant for smaller ROVs. But uh, for the few work class offshore ROVs, this is the, the, the beastie that we're going to be using out there. Um, you can see here that the transducer element is on a hydraulic ram to lift it above the frame of the ROV. Why might that be a benefit? Why might we want to have the uh, acoustic element uh, raised above the ROV or be able to be extended above the ROV like that? Again, answers on the screen or on the chat window, whichever works for you. What's the benefit of being able to raise that uh, transducer element above the frame of the ROV? Line of sight, yeah, good answer. Any other reasons why that might be good? Protecting from element, yeah, so you're absolutely right, Sean. Uh, so we can actually retract that back in as we, as we put the ROV back into the TMS. Better acoustic communication, true, yes. Uh, better for a number of reasons, actually. Uh, the main one being the first one being the line of sight that Ratna has uh, has already um, identified. But the other benefit really is the fact that this is a noisy bit of kit. Uh, and if if it's uh, the, if you get this a little bit further away from all this noise, it makes it slightly quieter. It makes and it makes better communication on that in that regard. But the main thing also is, as Ratna said quite rightly, line of sight. You know, we're going to be tracking our um, seabed beacons that are potentially below the ROV uh, as it's swimming around and flying around. So having this upwards gives us a little bit more angle uh, line of sight on that. Well, that's the RovNav transducer transceiver. 
Uh, the other transceivers that can be used in LBL systems is, and if you saw the uh, USBL webinar last week, you'll be familiar with this. It's the HPT, the High Performance Transceiver. That's our USBL head. Um, and there's also the dunker as well. So the 6G dunker, which is just a, basically a transducer and comms element, a power element that gets bodied, that gets lowered into the water. Um, and, uh, and then you have a power unit on the top, which connects into your PC. But those things are really used for uh, installation and calibration. So just be able to communicate with the array to get the setup done. Not usually used for, uh, for, for tracking, although you can track a vessel's position from either of these two transceivers using LBL ranges if you want to, more of that later. So that's the transceivers. Let's move on to the transponders. The bit to kit that give us our positions, the workhorses of, uh, of the LBL system. The, the, the fundamental part of the system is the compact, all right? The computing and telemetry transponder. And these are the 6G family ones. You can tell them because they're nice shiny red, red, red jackets with a big label that says 6G on it. So it's our sixth generation wideband two and two plus acoustic technology, all digital. Um, and uh, this one here, the compact six is the mainstay of LBL. This is the, the, the one you're gonna see on the seabed giving you the positions as we'll talk about later on, all right? So this is our seabed references, our satellites on the seabed, if you like, for, for our underwater GPS. Um, the gyro compact in the middle, this is mainly meant for putting on structures or other objects that you want to track sub C or get position for. And the, the, this is basically does everything this does uh, with, uh, with an inbuilt kind of um, uh, inertial system to give you heading, pitch, roll, and heave data out as well. So you can tell the attitude of the thing you're tracking whilst you're tracking it. So it's more of a, a moving object. Um, the AMT is uh, similar to the Compact 6, but the AMT stands for Automatic Monitoring Transponder. So once you've finished the LBL, this could be in the array or could be on your, on your pipeline or structure, whatever you're tracking. And once you've finished the job of actually positioning your, your system, uh, you can leave that down there, sub C, and it could be storing data automatically to its, its internal SD card, which you can recover acoustically, either with a manned or unmanned system. Um, the only difference in hardware between the AMT and the Compact 6 is the sticky label around the bottom, all right? Um, the, uh, th this, I keep clicking on the screen when I do that. This one here uh, has a sticky label, but they, they both have an SD card inside it, but this one has the function level to allow it to store data to that SD card. You can, however, upgrade this to be an AMT whilst it's deployed sub C. So if you finish the job and think, actually, be right, you're really useful if we can store some data and, and leave the system just storing data sub C without us needing to be here. Um, you can contact Sonodome. You can pay the up up upgrade fee. There's always a cost for everything. Uh, and they'll send you a piece, of, uh, a piece of code, which you just fire down acoustically to your transducer and reprogram it to be a, uh, um, uh, an AMT whilst it's deployed sub C. So don't worry if you, um, if you haven't got all the kit you need for a start with, it can be upgraded while it's sub C in, the, on, on, in many respects. And then in this 6G um, or the 6 Plus family, you'll notice the hardware looks remarkably similar. It's the same hardware, but it's just got a different sexy red jacket on it, uh, a sexy gray jacket on it rather, uh, with a, a rather fetching purple and pink label. This just tells you that it is the latest uh, programming um, uh, and protocols inside it, okay? Uh, many, many versions of the 60 kit can be upgraded to the, uh, to the 6 plus, uh, depending on the age of the, of, of the hardware. Um, but uh, the, and the one on the end there, the, the smaller one, this is the micro compact. It basically does everything this one does and this one does, um, it, but in a smaller form factor. So it's basically just for quick and short duration deployments, really, that's it. So putting these things on the seabed then, so you, obviously we need to have these things on the seabed to use them as position references. And by far the most preferred method is the rigid stand. And here's an example of one nice tall stand. Uh, and the collars on the tops of the stand are the same dimensions that they have been forever. The, even the very first compact we made was a certain dimension. Everyone had their, their buckets and, uh, and brackets all made for them. We've kept the same dimensions ever since. So it's kind of like a standardized product. And there's another version of a tripod stand. This one has a tray in the bottom that you can fill with cement to basically lower its center of gravity to be able to put it on a more uneven seabed. Now these rigid stands will be deployed uh, most often using an ROV um, and in shallow water the ROV might collect it from near the surface and then fly down and deposit it where it needs to be put on the seabed or more commonly they use a, uh, a job basket or a job frame. 
So they'll lower the job basket down with all the compacts in frames in, in the basket and the ROV will fly back and forth to the, the job basket and to the locations to deposit them on the seabed. And their position will be tracked, usually using USBL or often um, uh, another sort of profiling sonar that tells you relative to something else that's already down there. All right, so rigid stands then. Uh, what do you think would be the advantages of using a rigid stand for an LBL position reference? What are the upsides of using these, this type of uh, deployment system? Bear in mind, we're going to be using these to position our vehicle subsea. Offset, uh, what do you mean by offset, Rahul? Yeah, it can stand strong current. The position won't change, no movement from the transponder. Absolutely, yeah, stability, all these good things. Um, if there's any current down there, uh, then um, these things are going to stay where you put them. There's no sway, no movement, so that uh, you, if you, you, know, you, you, can, you can be tracking your vehicle uh, with high confidence. Uh, all good answers, thanks for that. So, you know what I'm going to ask you now? What are the downsides? Uh, uh, what are the problems uh, or potential um, pitfalls, if you like, for using... Uh, rigid stands. What might uh, what might put people off using this type of system? Any ideas on that? Again, use the screen or use the chat window. Thank you. They just withstand a strong current because they're very stable. They they put on the seabed and they just sort of stay where you, where you put them generally. Deployment issues. Yeah, it's. Uh, Vessel deployment, uh, they, they can sometimes fall over in the seabed if it's not even, but generally that's uh, part of your planning stage. Um, but yeah, deployment issues, the fact that they, uh, they're complicated, they're big, they're expensive. Uh, they take a lot of deck space. So if you've, got, if you've got like sort of 40, 50 compacts to deploy and you've got loads of rigid stands this size, you need a much larger vessel or a smaller vessel and do multiple trips in order to get that stuff out there. That just adds cost and time and complexity to the project, so therefore that might be why some people don't want to use um, uh, the, the, um, the, the rigid stands. So the other alternative then to rigid stands is exactly as Pro just said, using a ballast, uh, fast markers or clump weights. So we can um, have a, uh, a float collar uh, with a tether, and then we can uh, anchor that to the seabed using either clump weights or a fast marker. And these are fast markers. And that's a sort of clump weight example. So these fast markers are concrete base with a, a, a pole, um, and a hook on a pole, and then your tether attaches to that. And then the tether clips into the release mechanism on the bottom of the compact. And similarly here, you can see your float collar compact and the float collar release mechanism here. And then you've got your ballast on the seabed, which uh, with the clump weight is gonna be usually gravel bags or sandbags, uh, but basically 80 kilograms of weight to keep that thing down. This has an up thrust of about 20 kilograms. You need four times the down thrust to keep it on the seabed. Um, and again, these can be deployed using ROVs again uh, in, in deep water scenario. So they can be lowered down on a job basket in the same way that stands can be. Um, uh, they can also just be dropped over the side uh, in reasonably shallow water. You can take a, a GPS fix on the surface as you release the thing over the side, watch it plummet down uh, and take that as your initial start position. That's viable in certain certain, certain jobs, not for most. Um, but the other way, if you want more accuracy or more confidence of where you're putting this thing on the seabed, you can use you can consider using an acoustic release. This is basically a beacon that you can track with USBL. Uh, you can attach your load, and in this case I've got a rigid stand, but it could be one in a, one in a float collar with ballast weight on the bottom as well. You lower it down to the seabed, you're tracking the position of this, you're tracking the position of the beacon itself. Uh, and once it's in a position where you want it, you send a release command from USBL to your release mechanism and boop, down it goes onto the seabed, nice and easy. Um, and then when you want to get it back, you send a release command to the, uh, to the one in the float collar and off it comes. And uh, like I said, so float collars, clump weights, etc. So bear in mind what we know about these things now. What are the advantages of using this kind of, uh, of system? So I've left a bit of space on the screen if you want to use it. So what are the advantages of using float collars? Can we have trail tracking or snail trail? Uh, Rahul, yeah, we sometimes have... Uh, um, 
problems with it. We'll cover that in a second. Hopefully, we'll answer that one in a second. Advantages: stable movement. Uh, well, with, with with fast market and float collars, they're faster, they're cheaper. Samarlin, yeah, that's the sort of thing that you can see there. And also, look at the amount of space you need on the deck. There's a reasonably large deck anyway, but there's a lot of beacons can stored on the deck in that photograph. Uh, so you can you don't need such a big vessel, you know. Faster, cheaper, relatively inexpensive. Yeah, absolutely. All good answers. So therefore, then, what are the downsides and disadvantages of these uh, fast markers and float collars? Anyone think what they might be? Drifted by strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Subject to current, they may not drift so much. The uh, but uh, they will certainly sway. Um, and uh, I've got a, a, a quick. Um, picture here this is a fast marker hitting the seabed after being dropped from the surface so you can see there that that collides with the seabed the beacon up uh, above it will be kind of still traveling down for a little while uh, and potentially could smash into the top of the fast marker or if this was a clump weight here you could have the release mechanism actually damaging the clump weight bags and it could spill some ballast and become neutrally buoyant and then it, it still then it might start drifting around um, but the main disadvantage if you like is uh, is the sway collision and tangling? Yeah, Rahul, that's uh, the, the valid. You know, ROVs can get tangled up in these things sometimes, um, or, uh, or or tethers can get caught around them. But uh, but this here, you can see here that this is being caught a little by the current and it is being pushed to one side. Um, now the whole of the rainbow will be pushed to one side. But what you find with these these square square edge float collars is they kind of catch the breeze somewhat in the current and they start to spin and sway. So the sway won't be constant in one direction it will actually sway around in a business circle and actually start to spin as well um, which uh, obviously if you're using that for positioning that if your if your references are swinging around in the breeze then the position of your thing you're tracking is going to be somewhat in error so there's always a downside for these sort of things one uh, one solution for that sway is to use something like this which is a, uh, a hydro hydrodynamic float collar it's called the low drag collar it's uh, something we can we, we produce but you can see that this is much more hydro, hydrodynamic but that in itself presents a problem the flat-faced ones we see we, the traditional ones that you've seen offshore if you've been offshore anyway you'll see these are re relatively simple to handle on deck they they weigh about 30 kilos so they're not exactly lightweight but at least you've got flat edges and they come in two halves so you can break it down and move it around with a bit more a bit more ease this thing is a single unit there's no by half so you, you slide the compact through it and clamp it at the bottom um, and there's no flat edges so if you imagine trying to handle that on a deck offshore especially if it's wet and slippery uh, that's like a bar of soap just you know just asking to, to move around the deck so it comes with a handling frame so it's a bit more tricky so there's always a compromise with with, uh, with these things but they see um, fast markers or rigid stands rigid stands far more pre preferred but more expensive and more complex uh, fast markers are cheaper easier quicker but they have disadvantages as well so all these things get taken into account during the planning stage of an lbl dependent on what we call the error budget on how confident you need that tracking solution to be in the middle right? it will depend on the choice you make for, de for deploying your system so once we've deployed it, everyone happy with those that, that, that thing by the way give us a thumbs up or a tick on the uh, participants window good stuff Again, if you do have questions, fire them into the chat. Stu will be more than happy to uh, to answer. Moving on, then let's. Uh, once we've got those things on the seabed, and we actually want to start to uh, to use this system before we can use it as a tracking solution, we need to calibrate those positions in. Now we've put them on the seabed, and we've done so using drop positions. All right, so uh, I will talk about those in a bit more in a minute. But things we need to have and information the system needs, the software needs to do, to define those positions on the seabed are these things the drop coordinates the baseline ranges how far apart these things are and also the depth difference between each beacon on the seabed because we don't live in a nice flat world um and anthony yeah the minimum length of clump weight is uh, two meters so if the, if the tether is shorter than you it's too short all right um drop coordinates all right so the drop positions we know that uh, the, the deeper you go, uh, generally the more uh, a sort of error you're going to have in those original drop coordinates. What you need to do is give the software where you believe the beacons to be in the first place so that it can generate its kind of start, start model, if you like, in order to start the processing side of things. 
Now, those drop corners, where do we get those from? Um, if you're using a USBL system to position those beacons on the seabed, and that could be one of our systems, it could be uh, one of our, our, our competitive systems, it matters not, you can use our beacons with many of our competitive systems too. So we can get a position for them on the seabed, uh, and if you're in deep water, uh, your precision of the USBL system is dependent on water depth. The deeper you go, the, the less precise that is going to be. So there's going to be an error around the positions of these things on the seabed. You'll have an easterlies and northerlies, but you'll have a known. You'll know that that will be out by a certain amount of um, uh, of, uh, of of difference. Stu, I'll let you handle the questions on the chat at the moment. All right. Um, so, for example, if you've got a USBL system that is calibrated and you've got a report on that calibration that says your USBL position or USBL system has a precision accuracy or precision of water depth of, of 2% of the water depth and you're in a thousand meters of water, this easterlies and northerlies location for this beacon you have from the USBL system will be out by up to two meters. All right. So um, that's not good enough. If you want to track something with it, with, you've got error budget as well within two meters. That's why you need an LBL system. But understanding the amount of error you have in your original drop coordinates is important and you will see why very soon, okay? Because the next thing we're gonna do is get the system to calculate, well, that, before I carry on, what happens is once you've got these drop coordinates, you enter those into the software, the system will then compute how far apart these are, all right? Based on those drop coordinates. So we know that, that, that the, the estimated baseline length between these two will be so far, plus or minus about twice the error you get from the USBL system, all right? Or from the original drop coordinates. Because then we're gonna measure how far apart they are. We're actually gonna measure those baselines acoustically. And to do that, we tell the beacons to interrogate each other and, they, and then we, we work out the time of, uh, of flight. Now, if you saw the, the webinar last week on, on USBL, it's the same way US, our USBL system works, all right? It's, it's acoustic interrogation. We get an acoustic response back. We know that speed equals distance multiplied, uh, divided by time, all right? Therefore, the distance, to get the distance, you just multiply the speed by the time, all right? In this example, we've got a sound speed of exactly 1,500 meters per second. We send the interrogation from the beacon on the left. We hear the response back from the beacon on the right. You know, so it basically, it's all measuring from this end, starts the clock, sends the interrogation, stops the clock when it hears the response, and that whole process takes two seconds. How far apart are those two beacons? Answers on the screen or answers in the chat. 1500 says Bala, 1500 says Rashidi, 1500 says Sean. And I recognize your name, you were on previous webinars or you've been on training courses, so. But the math is fairly straightforward. And, uh, and no one yet has said 3000 meters. People do sometimes and that's, uh, that's absolutely fine. But uh, as, you, as you've all uh, surmised, it takes one second to get there, one second to get back. Uh, and so the acoustics may have traveled 3,000 meters, but that means that the things are actually 1,500 meters apart, all right? So absolutely right. Now, in reality, uh, the, this interrogation, you know, this is not going to respond instantaneously. There's going to be a processing delay. It's going to have to recognize that's a signal for it. It's got some, it's got some telemetry to embed in there, so we can do some analysis of the signal, put in the results of that analysis into its response. That takes a certain amount of time. Um, and, and any time delay at this end is going to add to the time measurement overall and therefore give us an error in our, in our range calculation. So what we do to mitigate that is we give it a known delay at the other end. We call this a turnaround time or TAT. So that turnaround time eliminates that processing delay um, and gives us a known amount of delay at this end that we can then take into our calculation. Um, so now the travel time, total travel time in this example, 2.2 seconds, the first thing the software does is remove that turnaround time delay at the other end to leave us with the precise acoustic distance between the two, acoustic travel time between the two, and that can be converted to range. Slam range again, 1500 meters. That means basically that the LBL system, being a range range system, is entirely dependent on this equation, right? So slant range is the two-way travel time minus that turnaround time, all multiplied by the speed of sound, all divided by two. Everything in LBL is based upon that equation because it's a range range system. When you're tracking, calibrating, whatever it is, it's all based on that equation. So therefore, 
what is the most important part of that equation? Answers on a postcard. Up on the chat, circle it if you like, uh, draw something around it, what the most important part of that equation is. Use the tools, doodle on my screen, write it in anything. Sound velocity says Anthony, speed of sound says Rashida. Yeah, Harry has circled. You circled turnaround time as well. <laughs> SV, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I kind of gave the answer away by moving the slide forward, forward too far. Uh, it's not exactly not the turnaround time, really. It's the, the most important thing is the speed of sound. The turnaround time is written into the software um, and, they, and, and the beacon is programmed with it. And you can change the turnaround time on the fly. Uh, but as long as it's the same in both the software and the hardware, that's all fine. But the one thing that can change in the environment is the speed of sound. Unlike radio, where speed of light is a constant, in sonar, speed of sound is not a constant. Therefore, in order to get the speed of sound into, uh, into LBL, the most important thing in LBL is speed of sound. If, you, if that is incorrect, if that speed of sound in the environment is different to the one you have in the software, all of your measurements will be wrong. And that means your system doesn't work. So to get that into the system, we use uh, sound velocity sensors. We can use a profiler or we can use a CDT Pro, but the most preferred method is to take a direct sound speed measurement from the environment while still tracking. Uh, and for that purpose, one of the options of sensors we can fit into a compact is a sound velocity sensor like you see here, and you can get that, that data acoustically. Which I'll show you how we get that later on as well. All right. Um, so that is the baseline ranges. Now I'm going to talk about depths. We talked about the, the drop coordinates. We talked about the baseline ranges, how we defer those. And now we just to determine that we live in a three dimensional world. The seabed is not always flat. We all know this. Uh, so the beacons will not be sitting absolutely level to each other. We need to take this difference in depth into effect because. The system is trying to derive the horizontal distance, the Latin long, the Eastings and Northings for those. Um, uh, Bala, that's a very good question. Uh, again, I'll let Stu answer that one. That's quite a good, good question. Uh, but the, the horizontal distance, we're trying to determine uh, how far apart these beacons are. Uh, and, but those baseline measurements, we're measuring point to point measurement, a slant range, right? Slant range by definition is sloping. Uh, so in order to to work out what that slant range equates to in terms of exactly how far apart they are on the eastern and northern, we need to determine how deep the, the beacons are in relative to each other. All right, two ways to do that. We can either use the onboard sensors, so all of our compacts are fit with a depth sensor straight away. So that's a, that's a dead easy way to do that. You just ask the compacts what for their depth in a certain time period, so you, you, know, you haven't got any issues with tide, um, and you can basically. Uh, define that into the system so you know exactly how deep they are that's okay but many of our depth sensors you, you know that we've got a whole range of different depth sensing we fit from really really accurate ones to sort of standard accuracy ones generally in an lbl array there's lots of hardware the the customers are not going to purchase high accuracy sort of you know science grade sensors for all of the, all the combats because it's expensive you might find one or two of them for user strain gate for um for tidal gauges later on but in the main part, they'll be kind of standard accuracy strain gauges. So you've got difference in error of the readings, and they're not, they're not potentially uh, they're not potentially very very accurate altogether. So the the most common method of deriving the depth or defining the depth for the beacons uh, in an LBL array is to use the ROV. So they'll fly around the ROV with a DigiQuartz high accuracy depth sensor and physically measure the depth of each beacon in the array, um, and then you know. We've taken out any area of tide, etc. They'll basically what's called a depth loop survey or survey in the depths, and that gives us the relative depth difference of all of the beacons. So that can be put into the system. What the system does is basically defines what we call a horizontal vert or a vertical datum, rather. Right. Um, so by knowing the depth difference and, and of, of any pair of beacons as we go around, we're basically measuring um, that side, right, of a triangle. Um, and we've already, as we've already established, we're measuring the hypotenuse using that slant range calculation, the baseline calculation, in order to define side B, the horizontal distance. What does that look like to you in terms of uh, a calculation that you may have seen at high school? If we're measuring side A and we're measuring the hypotenuse in order to, de to determine side B, does anyone recognize that kind of calculation? Pythag, says Rahul, yes. 
All right. We all did it in high school. Uh, we all thought when we left high school, we'd never have to use that again. Uh, and here it is being used in some of the most advanced systems in the world still to this day. Those uh, Greek uh, mathematicians knew their onions. Right. So using Pythag, all happening in the background. Exactly. We don't need to worry about it. That's what the, co the software does. So let's look at how uh, that at the, um, uh, the the calibration process. We've got the drop coordinates. We've got the uh, the depth calculations all in the system. Now we need to actually uh, see how we get those baseline ranges we talked about earlier on. All right. Um, so the data collection. We basically get the ROV to send a, um, a, a a signal to the first of the beacons in the array, telling it to interrogate all of the others. All right. So it basically sends out an interrogation to all of it. It's called a CIS, a common interrogation signal. And again, if you're on last week's webinar, you've seen this. It's the same process, same acoustics we use for our USB-L system. So it's a common interrogation and it goes into the water. It's basically a broadcast signal that all of our beacons are programmed to listen out for. As soon as they hear anything on that channel, they all respond automatically with an individual reply signal. Individual reply signal. It contains the identity of the beacon that is replying in terms of its address, its four-figure telephone number, if you like. So we know who's calling. And then all of that time travel data that we talked about in the equation is then sent to the ROV and then relayed back up to the PC via the umbilical to calculate, uh, to basically to, uh, calculate all of those baseline ranges. Now that common interrogation signal is like a group chat, all right? It's a common interrogation channel. It goes out to all the beacons in the array and they all respond when they hear it. It's a bit like a WhatsApp group. So if you have what you can set up a WhatsApp group, you only put certain friends into it. You send a message into the WhatsApp group. Only the people in that group will see the message and they're the only ones that will reply. And you know who's replied because their identity is clear on screen. Yep. Same thing we're doing sub C for the acoustics. So then we send out, we get that process happening. Uh, basically one click of the mouse, it starts the calibration process. All this happens automatically. So we're taking all these baseline measurements in all directions not just once, but many times, a minimum of 10 measurements in each direction. All right. So do we need to define the channels for this communication? You don't need to, they, they, they're set as default, but you can change them if you need to. You might need to change them if someone else is using the same channel. All right. So once you've taken all the measurements from all the beacons in all directions, um, it's then time to process that. All right. So, but, uh, but what happens is if, if it may not be ready to process it, or you may have, uh, if you've asked for 10 measurements in each direction, you may find that uh, you've missed some because you might have turnaround time clashes. The, uh, the, 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 the replies may be heading back at the same time and interfere with each other a little bit. So you may realize that, okay, I've got, uh, I've got 10 um, uh, from each of these. When I, when, when I interrogated all of them from this one, I've got 10 from this one, 10 from that one, 10 from that one, but I've only got nine from this one. So I need to, ask this one for a separate a separate measurement. So the system automatically, without the operator needing to worry about it, sends a message to that beacon telling it to individually interrogate the one it's missing some data from. So send out an individual interrogation signal, basically saying whatever that address of that beacon is, 2404, whatever it is, to say, okay, 2404, where are you? And it comes back with a common reply, which is basically saying, here I am, all right? Um, and that uh, and that gets relayed back again. So it, it can still fill up the data set, even if it's missed data during the common interrogation. Fully automatic, don't need to worry about it. One click of the mouse, all this happens automatically. And the individual interrogation or, and the common response is a point-to-point -point message, a bit like a telephone call. When you dial a number, you know that's the person who's gonna, gonna, gonna answer because it's the only number you can ring. Now in our Fusion uh, 1, uh, this is Fusion 2 you see on the screen, but Fusion 1, you have to take all those observations, all those measurements, and then process the, uh, the data. Click a process button and start the, the next stage. All right, in Fusion 2, it does real-time calibration. So it does once round the board, so it does uh, one measurement from every beak in every direction. Once it's got all those first measurements, initial measurements in, it starts the least squares network adjustment algorithm. Uh, and as it's adding more observations to it, it's just refreshing, the up, uh, refreshing that, that algorithm each time, and it's processing in real time which makes life a lot easier for the operator anyone that's ever that's done it and this stuff with fusion one we know that this is the bit that takes a fair amount of time with calibrating and QCing the data you can do this live as it's going on in fusion two um, and some some of the things that the system will be looking or the operator will be looking at in order to quality control that data to make sure there's uh, no errors in the system make sure nothing's wrong with it um, 
stand it's basically you can you can click on one of these lines uh, and it will basically bring up some data and the date and, and with every if you're getting sort of multiple observations of any measurements in life in general you'll get this statistical curve of data so the sort of spread of data you get the more precise the data the more narrow this curve is going to be but it will still pretty much have the same shape it's called a Bosian curve right and and there's a thing called standard deviation so the first standard deviation is 68 percent of the data and that's one of the, the markers that we use to qc our data to see kind of roughly how precise our data set is and what the quality of the data is like um and, and that first standard deviation here in this, in this example is two millimeters it gives you an idea of just how wide these two lines are apart um and this is how it's how it's actually represented in the software uh, it's called a histogram similar to fusion one but this is the fusion two version uh you'll have this is just showing the between two beacons in this case 2401 and 2403 so it's one baseline observation uh, one baseline measurement rather with lots of observations at the bottom here and one of the data sets we're going to look at is the o minus c now we talked when i said about the uh, drop coordinates that uh, when you first put the drop coordinates in those eastings and northings for each beacon it computes how far apart they are all right so it works out how far apart they are um, and then uh, when you take the observation, when you do the acoustic measurement, you, that's your observed. So the O minus C is the difference between what you just measured and what the system first computed those distances to be. So therefore, what is, uh, what would you expect to see in terms of a type of number in this box, in the O minus C box? Don't give me a number, give me a kind of a sort of a concept, a, a context for that number. What? What would be a good thing to see in that box? Least, yeah, least value, says Ratner. Potentially, smaller the better, says Rashida. Yeah, resolution, minimum, tending to zero. Uh, everyone says smaller the better. Everyone, a, lot, a number of people say zero. Um, not necessarily, all right? As part of the QC, what you need to know is the error of your original drop coordinates if you remember i used the example of a usbl system placing those things on a seabed uh with um with uh with a, 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 a two percent of water depth precision so in a thousand meters of water that might have a two meter error of those original drop coordinates so if your o minus c is around two meters or less happy days all right that's good because that is what you expect to see the so tolerance of deployment, absolutely, Harry. All right. So the it's that tolerance of the deployment of your of your your, your confidence in that original drop coordinate solution, which isn't going to be perfect because otherwise you wouldn't need an LBL system. All right. Uh, the purpose of an LBL system is to give you almost perfect tracking subsea in any water depth. Uh, so, but what so understanding the nature of your deployment system, how you derive the original positions, is important to quality control your calibration data. Want more of that come on a training course all right but basically good drop coordinates help you uh, help get good, uh, good qc and also help identify errors in the data set if for example you're expecting to see around two meters of error on those uh, on the o minus c because that's the that's the confidence of your, of your tracking solution when you put those things on the seabed then if you were getting three and a half three point seven four meters across all your o minus c's all of your o minus c's then that shows a systematic error and based on what we talked about earlier on, the most important thing in LBL is most likely to be a sound velocity error. Because if your sound velocity is wrong, all your measurements are going to be wrong. That t tends to sort of lead you down the arc. Okay, I need to look at my sound speed. And look here, this one's saying, telling me sound speed is 1490. If you suspect that your sound speed is not 1490, I never suspect, I never trust a fully a, a, a 0 0.00. You know, you, you've got to, if this doesn't look, look true to you, then maybe that's the problem. All right. Equally, if you've got a couple of them that are out and, then, uh, and they, all, they all feature the kind of one particular beacon, maybe your original drop coordinate was incorrect. Maybe you're, uh, you're, you're wrong. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of errors. And uh, Satish, we talk about errors in our training courses with the extent. These, these training courses, uh, it took three, four days, depending on the system you're training on. We talk a lot about errors. We talk about a lot of quality control. Uh, and, uh, and this is quite a cru crucial part of it, is analyzing and quality controlling this data. Other things we look at, they said already, the standard deviation. Also, the average baseline, does it make sense if we're expecting them to be a thousand meters apart? The average baseline should be around a thousand meters. You know, any errors there can be easily identified. 
total spread of the data, giving us an idea of just how precise it is, the quality of the data that's coming through. Lots of things that we can look at in order to, to check and double check and, and, do, and check all of our homework, etc. So there's our original drop coordinates, etc. Once we have processed that array, it's going to shift their positions, all right? It's going to happen. It's going to define those positions sub C. And there's going to be a difference. And we can QC that data as we go through as well. And we can manipulate that data and then fine tune it to get the, the system that we want. But that's only half the story, really, because that is a relative array. Once that's complete, we know that these things, uh, with, within whatever error budget we've accepted here, we know that these things are basically that far apart relative to each other. What we don't know now really is the true absolute position because the absolute position may be out by almost as much as twice the original uh, um, uh, error of our, of our, of our uh, deployment system. So in order to define the absolute position, there's one step to do. So you may not need to do an absolute position because you may already have some of these beacons, may, these may be mounted on a, uh, an, an existing structure or part of a previous array that you already knew they, that were those positions for. So everything is brought in relative to those, in which case, happy days, crack on, get the job done. Um, but if you want an absolute position for the entire array, we, we select the longest baseline, we conduct what's called a boxing calibration around those, which is sailing the vessel in a circle around the beacons independently, uh, firing down ranges uh, acoustically using a USBL system or a dunker on a, on a, on a pole that's been uh, calibrated in on the, on the vessel or dim conned in, taking GPS fixes for the vessel location. And then when you process that data, you're basically processing for a position on the seabed with a similar level of confidence as you have for your GPS system. So it's put an absolute position on the seabed from your vessel using the USBL system. Um, for a larger complicated array, you might want to choose a third one. But what happens here, the first one defines the position for the array, the second one defines its orientation, so you know which way it's pointing and relative to north and, and the compass. Uh, and, uh, and then once you've done all that, you do get a nice report, so you can analyze that data and see where everything is, uh, and, uh, and then basically crack on and start doing the next thing. Everyone generally happy with the calibration before I just go into the tracking. It's a very quick whiz through. Uh, in, in reality on training course, we'll spend you know, a good time talking about calibration. We'll spend an awful lot of time actually doing them and, um, and processing the data and looking at potential errors. But you're generally happy with the concept, the principles of how we calibrate the system. If you are, thumbs up or a tick on the, uh, on the, on the participants window. Change, ticks the thumbs up, thumbs up to ticks, etc. Yeah, awesome, All right. Everyone's good. If you, if you can't use those, just put yes. Thanks, Bala. Uh, right, moving on as we're getting towards the end now, let's look at how we get a position. So tracking of the system. Uh, I'm going to look at the two separate systems, Fusion 1 with 6G and Fusion 2 with 6 Plus. So with, uh, with 6G, um, it's basically uh, you send uh, similar to the calibration. So, so it's the same acoustic signals as going out. What we do is we, we tell the ROV to interrogate the array. Uh, it sends out an, a CIS and they respond with the IRS in the same way we do through the calibration. So it's just a common interrogation. Uh, they wait their turnaround times and they all respond with the IRS. And all of that two-way travel time data is fed back up to the computer to define the position of the ROV relative to those beacons on the seabed. I'm using triliteration. A little bit of that in a minute. But then when you want to get a sound velocity update, if one of these beacons is set up to be a sound velocity source, it's a separate signal. So it sends a request to that beacon. So it may, may, the system may, the software may be set up so every five minutes have a, a sound velocity setting. So every five minutes it will ping that beacon, it will pause tracking, ping that beacon, ask it for a sound velocity reading, it will send it back acoustically, and then it will carry on tracking again. So it has to pause tracking to update sound velocity. Um, and that is because, as we said at the beginning, uh, although we can get diagnostic telemetry in the ranging responses, any additional data that we need is a separate signal in 6G. Right? It's, it's a vast improvement over 5G, but it's, uh, it's, it's, still, it's still a little bit, uh, it, it could be better. So in 6 plus, we made it better. All right? uh, what we've done here is we've improved basically the ROV, the ROVNAV, is always listening out for signals. And we can program this beacon. Instead of programming the software to ask for an update of the SV, we program the beacon. We tell it, you're my sound velocity sensor. And this could be also uh, one thing as well that we've improved on Fusion 2 is we could have a multiple number of sound velocity sensors out there and the system will apply the sound velocity that's appropriate for each reading. But let's say this one again is our sound velocity sensor for the reading. Um, we can send out the interrogation CIS 
and the responses come back with IRSs and the sound velocity data embedded in the response. Um, and if we weren't tracking, or if this what that one beacon wasn't being used for tracking, it's just been told to give us a sound velocity reading every five minutes, then that's exactly what it will do. And it will send it back uh, autonomously, and the ROV will listen out and use that sound velocity reading on its own. So, and that again is because in the acoustics or wideband three, we can embed the telemetry in the ranging responses or basically tack it on the other end using uh, some special um, command language we've got now at the moment. Hardware the same, software is much, much better. So how, by using those systems then, by using that, that CIS and the IRS is how do we define the position? Well, it's, it's basic trial iteration. If you've seen anything on GPS, it's exactly how that works. Um, so if you break that down, you get all these different time level, you get all the two-way travel time data, convert that into ranges. And if you break that process down, the first range from two, three, or one will tell us we're that far away from that beacon. In reality, that's a circle around it, all right? But I've just made it an arc to, to make it easier. So, and this arc would be what's called a line of position. So we know the ROV on this first range is somewhere on this line of position on a big circle around it, all right? Second range then from 2302 would tell us we're that far away from 2302. So again, if this was a circle, we'd have a potential position there, but also another potential position here with the two lines across. So two, two uh, arrays, two beacons clearly doesn't define a position. Number three, then the third range from 2303 would tell us that we're where these three lines of, uh, of, of ranges trisect. So that gives us a, a now more kind of a, a reasonable position for our, um, our vehicle. However, what if one of these was an error? We had a bit of multi-path or, or a bit of delay on any of these systems. If any one of these was an error, this defined point would no longer be a point. There'd be a box of uncertainty in the middle and the system wouldn't know which range was, uh, was, the, was the problem. Therefore, we need at least four ranges to give us a defined position because now if any one of those measurements was incorrect because of a local sound speed issue or, or, or delay or, or multipath or what many of the other environmental systems that can affect acoustics, it would be easily identifiable. If this blue one was over here, for example, you can see we've got three lining up at one point and one that's over here. The system could easily identify that using what's called the W test and reject it as an outlier. So therefore, to answer the question that I think Rashida said earlier on, or, or uh, Rashida, um, someone else said earlier on, uh, what's the minimum number, or oh, Rizki, I think I asked, asked it, uh, what's the minimum number of beacons? It's four, the absolute minimum number of transponders. However, ideally five. And that's because you need that redundancy, that error check in the system. Just like your GPS system at home won't give you a position if you've got less than four uh, uh, satellites in view, it's the same thing for, for, for our underwater set and GPS if you like LBL. Need minimum of four, ideally five or more to get a good system. Exactly like GPS, correct. All right, so then uh, that's tracking ROV. Tracking a, uh, a structure is, uh, is similar. There's a couple of ways to do it. So the, the Fusion 1, Fusion 6G, uh, we would send a signal to the beacon on the structure. In this case, I've got a, uh, a gyro compact, which gives us heading, picture, and roll data as well. After as well, you could have two beacons on the structure to give you an acoustic heading as well. But it's the same process we saw before: signal down uh, to it, and is an acoustic instruction to that beacon to interrogate the array using CIS. Uh, it they all respond with their individual responses, and then the, uh, all the two-way travel time data is relayed acoustically back via the ROV rov nav transceiver up to the PC to define where the structure is relative to the array. And then when you wanted pitch and roll data, it was a separate message. So um, you, could, uh, you, could tell, uh, that you could tell this beacon to send this uh, at a certain time as well, and the system would be expecting to see it. But if you ask for, ask for information from it, it'd be a sensor command, and that would have to pause tracking to do it. And that again, slowed things down a little bit. Um, so in Fusion 2, uh, 6 plus, just like we saw with the sound velocity earlier on, uh, we're interrogating the array. It can still use the same method. And we can have that pitch roll and heading and heave data embedded in the responses as well, just to make things a lot more quicker. But not potentially quick enough, all right? So we can make that even quicker. And we've done that by introducing something called fast LBL or indirect ranging. Now this is clever stuff. In this case, you'll be tracking the ROV and the structure simultaneously in the array. So you need to be tracking both systems. Whereas normally in structure tracking, you wouldn't be tracking the ROV at the same time because that just slow, that used to slow the whole system down ridiculously. Now it actually speeds it up. By tracking the ROV at the same time as the structure, 
what we do is we basically um, we interrogate everything in the array. So the R of E uh, interrogates everything. So interrogating the beacons and it's interrogating the structure to define how far the beacons are from the ROV to define the ROV position, but also how far the structure is from the ROV. Um, then, uh, included in that interrogation was a time delay message to the beacon on the structure. So every, everyone is slightly different, so unable to, don't get to identify which one's which. After that short time delay, the, be the structure itself interrogates the array and the ROV listens out for those responses. So I'll replay that again. So interrogation goes out to everything, short time delay, then a second interrogation goes out from the structure and the ROV is listening to the, to the responses. That defines that triangle, how far the structure is from the ROV, how far the ROV is from the beacon, and how far the structure is from the beacon. If you can do that for all of those, um, all of the array, then you can define the structure position and the ROV position in similar update rates as you can from normal ROV tracking. It's called fast LBL indirect ranging and is unique to Fusion 2 6 plus wideband 3 technology. So last little thing, and I, I realize I've just overrun by a couple of minutes, I do apologize. Um, the LBR technology, as, as we covered the other week, can be used for metrology, all right? So uh, to define, once we've, we've positioned these structures on the seabed, we may need to, to measure how far apart they are in order to put a connecting piece between them. So we can, it's like ninja level LBL. So we put a, 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 a beacon on each structure, surround it usually with a braced quad, uh, to measure the exact difference and also to measure the lateral offsets as well as the X, Y, and Z offsets and the angular offsets uh, from all of those. And once we've defined the, uh, exactly how far apart these things are, how far apart the hubs are, all that data is put into a spreadsheet. That, date, that spreadsheet data, then uh, the mass is applied and then put into a, um, uh, a CAD diagram for the fabricators to weld up and, and cut and weld the uh, connecting piece precisely so they can be lowered down to the seabed and fit precisely between two hubs. Um, it is, like I said, ninja level LBL uh, likened to plumbing your bathroom through measurements that you took through the window. Imagine just sort of measuring stuff from the window of your bathroom, going away, cutting the pipework, throwing it in and someone fitting it for you perfectly. That's metrology. That completes everything I want to talk about. I do apologize for overrunning a little bit, but this is just to summarize what we've covered. We looked at what LBL is, uh, how we deploy it, the sort of hardware and the software that we're using and how we actually position that stuff on the seabed. Um, we looked at how we calibrate the array, so we're able to use it for a position. Uh, and we sort of viewed the communications acoustically that are happening between the various bits of kit during the calibration and also during tracking. And then finally, how we derive a position underwater using the system. And if you want any more information about anything that we do, uh, then there's some information. You, you've, you've seen our website, that's how you access this webinar. Um, you, and most of you are following us on LinkedIn. Uh, keep on following us to get more updates, uh, including um, uh, online training. We are actually uh, being, uh, soon going to be able to offer full LBL training remotely. All right? So, um, so if, you, if you can't travel to us and need training urgently, uh, send us an email at training at sonodyne.com and we can, uh, as soon as we've got that ready to go, we'll let you know and, uh, and we'll send you some prices and details on how to access that. Uh, follow us on Twitter as well. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, sorry for overrunning ever so slightly. I hope it hasn't impacted your day too much. Um, uh, but thanks for your time. Hope you're all staying safe and keep in touch and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you all guys. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your messages.